thanks for everyone for joining us. This is our second event for our uh, Path to event series. So last, or actually it was January, we did an event with uh, the VP of Engineering at Drift. So that was Melissa Leffler. So if you're ever interested in checking out her career path, you can check out the video, it's on VentureFizz. But uh, today we're gonna talk about the path to CTO, which is an exciting, exciting path. And uh, Laura Major is the CTO at Motional and she has an amazing story to tell. So Laura, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. So uh, just some quick housekeeping tips before we kind of get into the full interview of your background and everything we're gonna talk about. Uh, I'm the founder of VentureFizz, my name's Keith. If you're not familiar with VentureFizz, we are the leading job board and company discovery website focused on the tech industry. And I'm gonna sound repetitive because I did this back in January, but it's amazing. Uh, the tech industry has been so resilient during this crazy time, but our job board has the most jobs we've ever had. There's almost 5,000 jobs, which, uh, it's amazing because if you told me that a year ago, I would have said you're crazy one year later in this pandemic that we'd have the most jobs we've ever had on VentureFizz. So we've already eclipsed one, what we had back in January. So if you are looking for a new opportunity, regardless of job function, engineering, product, user experience, sales, all different job functions, go to venturefizz.com backslash jobs. And there's definitely lots of great opportunities for you to, to explore. So, um, we're going to talk to Laura about her career path to a CTO role. We're going to talk about her you know, background story, um, key decisions that she's made along the way, and of course, some great career advice for you to follow if you are considering that your own career path. Um, so I'm going to do something that I've never done before. So I'll, hopefully I don't screw this up, but um, I'm going to try to do a poll. And this is just going to go out to everyone and you can uh, fill it out decide what you're hoping to learn today. And this will help us, you know, gear the conversation or steer the conversation towards whatever we're hoping to learn about today. Um, so this is the first time I'm using this feature on Zoom, which is actually working. This is amazing. So, uh, but so with, with Laura, we're gonna talk about lots of advice on helping you get to that career path. So um, it looks like people are looking for career advice and how to work my way into a CTO role. So you're in the right spot because we're gonna talk exactly about that. Um, and not only are we going to talk about that, we're going to talk about cool tech like um, moon exploration systems, uh, drones, and autonomous driving. So, so cool. All right. I was, I was happy that that poll thing worked. Uh, all right. Back to you, Laura. Thanks so much again for taking the time to do this. Um, let's start off by going back, back, back. So let's talk about the foundational years. Like, where did you grow up? You know, what were you like as a child? Yeah, I, uh, I grew up in Naples, Florida. It was uh, now it's a more uh, vibrant, uh, you know, hot area to visit. But back when I was growing up, it was a sleepy uh, retirement town. Um, and so I had uh, my parents were entrepreneurs. They uh, had a medical supply company. So it was a great a retirement community is a great place for a medical supply company. Theirs was the first one in town. Um, and so I, I really grew up, you know, seeing what it took to uh, be a business owner. You know, I would often on Saturdays uh, spend the morning uh, in the office with my dad. Uh, he'd be catching up on work and I'd be, uh, you know, messing around in the store, checking out all the, the latest uh, gadgets that they had. Um, and, and as I got older, I would help my mom, you know, file paperwork. Uh, so I really saw, you know, kind of the work ethic uh, that it takes to, um, to be a successful business owner. I love that too. Cause like, so my, likewise, my, my dad was an entrepreneur. So on uh, Sundays I was cleaning, he, he had a manufacturing facility and I was cleaning it. Uh, so while kids were out playing, I was learning work ethic and I'm, you know, probably didn't enjoy it at the time, but I'm grateful now. Cause it's, uh, it was definitely good foundational building blocks. So, so how did you get so deeply involved in, uh, you know, STEM? Like, how did you decide that that was kind of an area of interest? Yeah, for me, you know, I, I always, um, uh, math and science came very easy to me. It was very natural. Um, and so uh, my mom picked up on that pretty early on and, um, and pointed out to me that, you know, there was this thing called engineering <laughs> that I should think about, um, you know, and so she planted that seed very early on before I really knew what engineering was. Um, I happened to have a, a great uncle who um, was an engineer, a civil engineer, um, and he developed some, you know, some new uh, concepts and technology for the housing industry. Um, and so, uh, you know, at holiday get togethers, she would often ask him to uh, give me a little advice and share a little bit about 
what it was like. Um, and he built a an international business, uh, you know, in the housing industry. So he, he, you know, he would share with me a bit about where he got his ideas, how he started his company, um, and you know what an engineer does. It was it was hard for me to really translate at a young age, you know, how, you know, doing a problem set in a high school math class would become a career, um, and so it was really through kind of you know his storytelling that that helped me see that I could connect those things that that you know, I enjoyed in school to something that could have an impact on the world. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the academic years, so how did you decide like what to study in school? Yeah, I always had two sides of myself. Again, I had the side that, you know, math and science uh, came, came natural. I enjoyed the beauty of, you know, classes like optimization. Um, but I also had this other side where I've always been intrigued by psychology and by people, how people make decisions, um, organizations, teams, how teams work together. Um, and so, you know, when I went into college, I was sort of, you know, not sure which direction I was going to go. Um, I, you know, had had this psychology interest as well. And so, uh, you know, luckily during my college tour, my mom insisted we include uh, engineering schools. And so um, at Georgia Tech is really uh, while I was touring the campus, you know, one of the tour guides pointed out this building that uh, that did engineering psychology. Uh, that really figured out how do you design, you know, cockpits at the time, it was all aviation focused. How do you design cockpits so that, you know, so that a pilot in the middle of a crisis situation uh, has the right information at the right time and can access it, you know, intuitively. And uh, that really, you know, struck a chord with me and, and um, got me excited and kind of convinced me to not go the liberal arts path, but to, to, to go engineering and, um, and, so, you know, it was the, it was a, a great connection point for me that really kind of uh, got me focused. Okay. And then, and then you ended up going to MIT, uh, you know, to further your studies and there was a, but there was a professor at Georgia Tech that was really a, a role model as well, right? That's right. As you know, as all engineers know, um, you know, an engineering undergrad curriculum is really, it just kind of sets the foundation. You take thermodynamics, you take, you know, optimization, you take uh, statics and, and dynamics. Um, and so, but I had one class, uh, you know, I got one little class on um, human computer collaboration and uh, the professor of that class uh, was Amy Pritchett. And, um, and she, again, kind of, uh, you know, connected for me the things, again, where I, this foundation of engineering, how that could connect to things that I enjoy doing, which, you know, the class was all about how do you design a system so that it, so that a person can effectively use that system and really, you know, have, have the impact that you want. Um, and so I did some research in her lab as an undergrad. And, uh, and really, you know, she was a great mentor to me and connected me to uh, the program at MIT that I ultimately went to. She introduced this program around, you know, humans and automation and, and autonomous systems um, in the aerospace department. And, uh, and so I followed in her footsteps and, uh, and went, went to MIT. So after MIT, like, what did you end up doing next? Like, so how did you get, you know, involved in, in the early foundational years of your career? Yeah, after MIT, um, I discovered this place called Draper Laboratory, which was across the street from MIT. Um, and so we, you know, the, they were looking at the time for somebody who, um, again, who was kind of at this intersection of autonomous systems and, and the, the users. Um, they weren't quite sure what that meant. And, um, but we, you know, somebody there knew somebody in the, the lab that I was in at MIT and, and we got connected and ultimately, you know, they hired me, but I was the first one to come in to really um, kind of help figure out, you know, how we could go from just thinking about pure, you know, tech development to again, the, you know, changing how we were approaching the design of autonomous systems so that they could be uh, more, you know, useful uh, to people. Um, and so, you know, I, I joined and, and really kind of got that started uh, there at Draper. And for context, the, the year, like when you graduated from MIT to working at Draper, like what year was that? Yeah, it was around 2005. Right. So autonomous systems. I mean, so you were very early on in terms of researching that and studying that to then it's your career. Um, so, so what were some of the you know, initiatives that you got to work on some of the projects at Draper? Yeah, most of this yeah, development was happening, was funded by DARPA at the time. So it was still a, a research project. Um, but yeah, it was um, one of my early projects that I, that I got to work on uh, was a NASA project. So at the time, uh, under the, the Bush administration at the time, there was this mission to send people back to the moon. 
um, but we were looking at going to the South Crater because, um, sorry, the South Pole, uh, so that we could land on you know the edge of this this crater where you could have kind of infinite infinite um, light, so you could power your system better. Um, and so, um, in order to do this, though, you have to land you know where there's both extreme light and extreme darkness. So we needed to introduce this new uh, sensor into uh, the landing system, which was lidar. Uh, now we it's use crazy. that autonomous <laughs> driving. And so we were designing an autonomous flight manager on board uh, that could, you know, take in the LIDAR data and be able to rapidly, you know, create a picture in the cockpit of, you know, where was a safe place to land and where was unsafe and really optimize that decision making on board. Uh, because every second, you know, that, that you build into that last part of the trajectory, you know, requires fuel that you brought all the way from Earth. So uh, there was a desire to, to bring that down from in, at Apollo. It was around 90 seconds they had until touchdown from when they first saw uh, the landing area. And we were trying to bring it down to, you know, 45 or even 20 seconds. Like when I hear stuff like this, like mind blown, I think mean, it's so cool. <laughs> like, and I like how complex that is, like autonomous systems. I just think about it in general. There's like, just, it's so difficult to build. Um, so to do what you were doing, especially at that time frame, because computing is a lot different than it was then, right? As far as the computing yes. horsepower. So it just must have added extra layers of complexity. Yes, certainly. Yeah, it was it was a you know a challenging problem and um, and a, a very exciting to work on. We got to work with many of the Apollo astronauts. You know, talk about a change in compute power uh, and hear what it was like then um, and how much you know we looked at things like how much processing and decision making happened off board versus on board um, and you know what what that what surprises they found in those final moments um, so that we could again figure out how to design the right technology going forward. Got it. Um, did you like, I'm going to take a quick sidestep and I want to come back to Draper. Did you always know that you wanted to be a CTO? Like, was that something that you kind of like, all right, I'm leaving MIT and I'm, I'm, I want to eventually lead, you know, a company as an executive of the, as a CTO? Um, I can't say that I, you know, charted my path exactly to this moment. Um, for me, it's more been about in every role that I get into, you know, I'm off, often looking to see, you know, what's the impact of, of this piece that I'm building or working on or team I'm building, you know, what's the impact of that, of, of that system and that team and, um, and kind of charting a path to continue to grow the impact, um, expand the bandwidth. And um, I think through that, uh, I've always enjoyed leading teams. I also played sports in high school. Uh, I was a fast pitch uh, pitcher in softball. Um, and so, you know, teams have always been a big part of, um, of my background and what I enjoy doing. And so I, I'm not surprised I ended up in this place. Um, I was definitely one of those young girls as well. In preschool, I, I was called bossy. Um, so <laughs> one of those girls who suffers from, uh, from that problem. Um, but of, you know, where leadership gets, gets called bossy. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, I'm, I'm not surprised I'm here, but it wasn't like I, I I charted every step to get to this moment. It was more for me, you know, my career has been all about trying to make impact, trying to deliver results um, in, in what I was doing and really seeing things through. And I think through that process, you kind of create that narrative of, you know, what you're able to achieve. And so naturally, when you achieve one thing, then then you get asked to do the next, you know, to do the next thing. And then it, it continues to, to grow. So Truthfully, I'm a little surprised to have reached CTO. You know, I, I don't, um, I think imposter syndrome is something, you know, many of us feel, um, but it, um, but I'm not also, you know, I think it's been through each of those moments of proving to myself what I'm capable of and also proving to others what I can do. You said, so you played uh, fast pitch softball, so you were a pitcher? I was, yes. Yeah, so I, I, I when they have the college softball series happening on ESPN. I'll watch that. And I, I am frightened by how fast that ball is moving and how much closer you are to the plate to be able to hit, make a decision that you're going to swing and hit. So, uh, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> like, I, so, uh, but it just shows, you know, you had the competitive side to you too. Um, yes, so, uh, now uh, one of these key moments in your career is you decided to take a sidestep, right? To, like you started building a family. And I think this is important to note because you know, whether if you're male or female, some people may think that, oh, I got to keep, you know, climbing the ladder if I want to eventually hit my career goals. Yet sometimes, you know, uh, making decisions like this, which is better for the individual may work out 
better for the long run. So what was, what was that part of your story? Yeah, so I had I had achieved a lot at Draper at this at this point in time. I had been there for I don't know five years appro- approximately, and um, and you know I I had developed um, a team, a technology area. I guess maybe longer. I had been running a team for four years, a team that I had created, um, and and yeah, I got pregnant and was yeah um, you know starting my family, and and in that moment, I again I had built this team for four years. It was. Uh, achieving a lot was had really you know um, developed it was robust and so and I've been growing uh, mentoring you know my successors and so I saw the moment when I got pregnant and wanted to take a little pause in in the pace of my career um, you know I saw the opportunity to to let one of you know um, my mentees t- take the role of leading the team and uh, and so I started looking for what what I could do next. Um, I decided to to go down first to half time, and I quickly went up to three days a week. Um, but I stayed at three days a week for uh, for a number of years. Um, and you know during this time, I was uh, given a, a great opportunity by a mentor at, at Draper um, to to focus on business development and um, specifically around uh, DARPA. Uh, so I, I went and spent uh, time going down to DC regularly, working with with DARPA PMs and trying to really understand what they were trying to achieve and connect that to technology that Draper was developing and and really help you know kind of uh, form strategy, form um, you know roadmaps, uh, technology uh, you know development plans to to help uh, achieve the next you know biggest things that DARPA was trying to achieve. Do you think this was like a like a, a step outside of your comfort zone, like, cause you were building systems, you were more, you know, leading technical teams. Now you're on the business side. Like, was that uncomfortable at first or were you like, this is, you know, just as easy as engineering? Absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was very uncomfortable. And I think I had a lot of people asking me at the time, why are you doing this? This seems like you've created this team, you've created these programs, this technology, why would you go do this? Um, and, but for me, you know, it, it, for me, it made sense. I mean, I think I saw an opportunity for a short period to dive deep into a, a set of activities and, you know, that I didn't really have skills in yet. I hadn't been at that focus point with a customer, you know, and really been responsible for trying to help make new things happen with customers. And so uh, I had done that from an engineering standpoint, but that's, it was different. So I saw that, you know, I would learn a lot and can hopefully contribute, but, but also learn a lot about, um, about some of those other dimensions of, of business and customer interaction and, uh, you know, how to, how to shape, uh, you know, the, the future um, strategy. Which I think this is an important kind of like flag in your career of building and charting your path to a CTO where, yeah, as a technologist, you need to be very sound there and competent, but also you need to be part of the executive leadership team that understands the business and what are you working towards? What do customers want, need? How do you deliver? How do you monetize? So um, so this like sidestep ended up being part of that well-rounded experience that you I would think would be instrumental to do what you do today. That's right. I think, you know, some of the things, the, the skills and the intuition that you need as a CTO, uh, you won't get them by only, you know, staying in a tech bubble. You have to be able to think, you have to understand how businesses work. You have to understand, you know, what matters and how do you drive, you know, strategy? How do you set things in motion for a longer term goal rather than just, you know, a near term uh, tech objective? So, yeah, I think it was, it was through some of those experiences that I really gained some of that intuition and yeah, and insight into those areas. And one thing that I didn't mention earlier, we're, we're going to have, uh, you know, save some time at the end for Q&A. So on Zoom, there's a, a Q&A part. So there's like, raise your hand in the chat. Uh, I think the best thing is if you have questions, you just put it uh, in like the Q&A part of, uh, of, of Zoom. And then at the end, we'll, we'll go through these different questions. Um, okay, now now you go from Draper, very successful career. You're on this great trajectory. You decide to go to a startup. So, what was the decision there, and what did you end up doing? Yeah, so you know, I think I had um, after you know many uh, sort of moments at Draper. I then I was running a division um, when I left. I had a I had grown to about a hundred person division. We had expanded from you know the first group I created to include the machine learning, deep learning expertise, software architecture. So it was I had done a lot at Draper. I was really you know I'm really proud of, of what my you know what my team accomplished. Um, but I started um, 
I, I noticed a trend that was happening, um, which was that a lot of this technology that had lived only in the industrial space in military applications or, or other industrial applications was now starting to make its way into the, into the commercial world. Uh, so autonomous driving being the, the greatest example, but I saw this trend and, um, you know, I, uh, I, I gave a talk, I was asked to give a talk at a, at a key conference on um, you know, what, what we've learned in these industrial applications and how some of those learnings can translate to the commercial space. And um, you know, it was through that uh, that I thought I started thinking deeply about this and I, and I really had the realization that there were, you know, the commercial space wasn't quite set up yet um, to harness you know, the lessons we learned in, in the industrial space in how do you, you know, develop and field autonomous systems. So the first, yeah, the first, um, you know, an opportunity came up uh, with, with Sci-Fi Works, um, you know, where they were looking for a new first VP of engineering um, at a critical phase in, in the company. And, um, and it was an exciting technology, you know, drone, uh, you know, a tethered drone. So where you can have persistent power so you can fly for, for days at a time or, uh, you know, many hours um, and, and so um, they were, they had, you know, fielded the system in military applications, but they were starting to look at some other commercial applications. And so, yeah, I joined Sci-Fi and, uh, and, and helped uh, to leverage that technology for a, you know, a, um, a different commercial application for, uh, it was for, you know, oil and gas um, refineries being able to go into these very dangerous uh settings and and do the inspection so that you could you know look at the integrity of a vessel and, and determine if it's um you know if if that integrity is there or if maintenance is needed before you know and keep people out of that hazardous space unless they're needed for maintenance and also had a use case like originally was with uh, for safety right like it was monitoring the boston marathon for for That's public right. safety that's right, exactly. Yeah, there were a lot of applications at the border, at the yeah for public safety at the marathon. Um, there were a number of large events uh, that that yeah that, that our system was used for as well as military applications. Now you ended up making the shift here from VP of Engineering to CTO. So how is the role different? Yeah, I was you know originally brought in to kind of run the team and um, and help you know shape shape the technology. But yeah, I think the the change from VP of engineering to CTO is really, um, it, it kind of raises the responsibility. Um, you, you now become kind of a key partner to the CEO. Um, usually you, you know, take a, you, you take a core, you know, role in a lot of the board interactions, um, big business decisions you tend to be, you know, involved in. Um, and you really kind of start thinking, you know, beyond just, the, the tech development, but but how strategy, um, you know, how's the business setting itself up for that next technology leap you want to make? Um, so there's just a increased level of responsibility, I'd say, and, and expectation. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about what you're up to now. Motional, autonomous driving. So uh, give the details on 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 motional in terms of like just to set the stage. Yeah, so Emotional, we are a joint venture um, that we are, you know, half owned by um, Aptiv, uh, you know, a leader in automotive technology and half owned uh, by Hyundai Motor Group, obviously a leader in uh, the design and, and manufacturing of, of vehicles. And, um, and so Emotional, we're focused, you know, um, on level four autonomous driving, uh, leveraging, of course, you know, our collaboration with our parent companies. And, uh, you know, we're, we're making some tremendous progress. We have our uh, level four system that's in operation today, commercial operation um, in Las Vegas on the, the Lyft network, where we have, you know, paying customers can, uh, can hail a, an autonomous ride. Um, and then we also recently uh, had a, had a, you know, significant milestone that we announced, which is um, that we we went driverless for the first time, where we removed the safety operator from the driver's seat, and we now you know have have confidence um, that you know we our driverless system is is uh, is able to operate without the safety operator. And this was the the, the testing in Las Vegas, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exciting. So, and I think what's really cool about the Boston tech scene is how a lot of this was developed it's MIT and then Natonomy was the startup that ultimately was acquired by Aptiv that kind of was the foundation for a lot of what you're doing, right? 
That's right. Yeah, there were two startups, actually. There was an MIT startup, Newtonomy, and there was a CMU startup, Automatica, that, that were brought together. And so, yeah, really, you know, leaders um, in this in this tech space, you know, going back to, uh, you know, DARPA uh, Grand Challenge days. Um, and that's right. I think, you know, it was those tech leaders that really formed the foundation that, um, that yeah, Aptiv acquired and, and that we ultimately uh, created Motional out of. So what you're building is incredibly complex. So this requires an incredible team to pull off what, you know, this is uh, world changing technology. This isn't building the next great photo sharing app. This is incredibly difficult. So what's the scope of your role and responsibilities at Motional as a CTO? Yeah, so you're exactly right. This is a complex system, you know, safety critical system. Um, so. So it's a lot different than you know than a, a web-based system. Um, so there's you know hardware involved. There's sensors. There's compute. Um, you know there's software. There's you know AI, machine learning, um, but also all the like software infrastructure simulation that you need to develop and test uh, these capabilities. And then you know ultimately it's um, system engineering and system architecture that brings all that together to create you know not just again cool one-off technology, but a system that works. Um, and and so yeah, at, at Motional for me, um, CTO means you know all of all of those capabilities um, report into me, and I um, I kind of you know lead lead those teams um, to again not just create uh, stovepipe technology, but create you know a solution, a system. And what's the size of your organization? Um, yeah, we're we're on the order of you know hundreds of engineers at this point. So what's it like a day in the life look like for you? So like, 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 how do you manage your time? Like, I imagine you're juggling lots of meetings. So what's a day in the life look like for you? And how are you able to, to juggle it all? Yeah, absolutely. So I spend my time, you know, I would say um, split between, uh, there's a lot that goes into, you know, building and maintaining and, and scaling a team. So, you know, I, I meet with my, you know, my leadership, all of our VPs and engineering um, all the time, you know, every day I'm meeting with at least one of them or getting bringing them together. Um, and, and we often are, are talking about, you know, either technology challenges we're having, technology strategy, um, you know, things that were projects that we're working on, or also the personnel side, you know, who, how are we going to complement our team? What's that next hire we're going to make? You know, what are we doing to, to challenge our team? What are we doing to support their career development? Um, so it's it's really multidimensional. You know, it's it's not just the tech. I mean, the tech is obviously the focus always, but it's also about building that team and setting them up for success. Um, so yeah, so I spend a lot of time with them. Um, I also I spend a lot of time with the executive team, with with my peers, and with our CEO, with Carl, um, talking about again strategy, um, not just what we're doing today, but how is the system going to ultimately deploy? What are the challenges with, with getting to that point? Um, what what new challenges do we need to start thinking about technology um, to help us solve? Um, and then of course you know. The CFO, the budget. How are we going to get there? How are we going to deploy our capital in a, you know, in a strategic way to make sure that we're making progress in the right areas? Um, HR, you know, what's how do we shape, you know, the team that we're building? Um, so I'm working, you know, with, with all of uh, with all of my peers on a regular basis. Um, and then, you know, I spend a lot of time also reviewing our progress on our current programs and hearing about what technical risks are we facing, what, you know, how are we performing on the road, what's the new feature we're developing, how are, what's the, you know, do a design review for that feature, um, as well as having deep technical reviews on, you know, key strategic topics. Um, so sort of, you know, maybe three parts, and I think all of that ultimately also leads to, um, I have to spend, you know, a decent amount of time preparing for and, and interacting with our board, um, which again, pulls across all three of those activities. Um, but that helps us keep focused on, on what matters to us as a business. So if you're, you know, advising someone, um, like, what do you think are the key skills that are needed to be a successful CTO and, and leader? I mean, because you know, you're a leader, so regardless of job function, if you're a CEO, CTO, CFO, you know, your executive leadership. So, what do you think are the the, the key skills, and you know, that are needed to be a successful CTO? Yeah, so I think it kind of breaks down into three areas. You know, one is um, you have to have your own technical expertise. 
So, you know, you want, before you become a CTO, you want to do, you want to achieve something technically, you know, and, and again, go deep enough um, technically so that you can have that technical intuition and it won't be on everything, right? Like I said, I have a hardware team. I have a software team. I have, you know, simulation, I, you know, so you can't be an expert in all things. That's impossible, but you need to have your own area that, that you really know well. Um, secondly, you know, I think is, is the team part is knowing how to, um, to shape and create and leverage a team. So there's, it's impossible to, you know, to be successful at this scale uh, by doing everything yourself. I'm a big believer in delegation and empowering, you know, setting up the right team, giving them a vision and empowering them to go and, you know, and do the right things, make, make it happen. Um, and so that, that is a skill set, you know, um, and so I think if you're interested in becoming a CTO, it's first, it's, you know, mentor a student, mentor an intern, learn how that, see how that goes and kind of, you know, and then, then have a small team, then have a bigger team, you know, kind of, you have to, you have to grow those skills, um, you know, uh, through, through experience. And then also, you know, watch, watch others um, who you think are doing a good job and, and kind of model some of the things that they're doing. And then third is business. You know, I think you have to have an understanding of strategy and business and, you know, how do you connect the tech to what you're ultimately trying to achieve as a company and um, understanding, you know, the realities of how that works and, and how you kind of have to manage through, uh, through challenges. And um, again, work, you know, work with your partners, work with your board, work with your peers uh, to, to get through challenges. Well, there's definitely some uh, parallels, which makes sense, of course, uh, to the event we held in January with Melissa, um, and especially the technical part that she mentioned. So Path to VP of Engineering, she mentioned she, on purpose, stayed as an architect longer. She was getting pushed into management to run a team, yeah. and she was excited to do that. But she said, wait, I, I need to learn the technology side before I can take that step up. So it's interesting to hear you say the same thing of staying on the technical course don't just rush into management because that's supposed to be your trajectory. It's, uh, you know, make sure that you're, you know, obviously you get away from the technology as you groom your career, but you mm -hmm. got to have that foundation at first, right? That's right. And I often, you know, on, on a project where I'd be leading the project or leading the team, I'd pick a small piece of that project and I would own the, the tech development for that. I would write code. Okay. Um, and that, you know, allowed me to, to, to stay connected to what we were doing and, um, you know, at, in a detailed way to be in the code and, and be able to see, um, you know, see how the, the, the solutions were, were coming together or not coming together, where the challenges were, allowed me to ask the hard questions and, and understand the trade-offs. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, as long as you can keep doing that, at some point you can't quite maintain that um, when you have such a large team, you, you will neglect the other things you need to do if you are still, you know, having your, uh, your own uh, side project. But um, yeah, that was important to me to do uh, as, you know, as I progressed. Well, Motional is hiring. You're hiring for lots of different teams within your organization. So, um, you know, this is going to be one part, hey, let's promote that Motional is hiring, right? So, but two, I, I think this is important because it's showing the lens of what you think as you're building your team, you know, because your team is the one that executes the vision, right? If you don't have a great team that can't execute the vision, it's going to fail. So how do you evaluate talent like how do you evaluate people to join your team like the interview process or whatever you do yeah so i mean we have a you know rigorous interview process like like most places do um but i think yeah for me again i i look for um people who have that ownership mentality who you know want to take uh, initiative um who you know of course you have to evaluate you know give them the the problem sets evaluate their technical skills but on top of that you know i want to see initiative um drive people who are excited about our mission, who, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. You know, we're trying to uh, make, make our roads safer, we're trying to, you know, make mobility accessible to all. Um, and I want people who are passionate. Uh, the other, another piece is, um, you know, collaborative. I think, again, what we're trying to achieve is, is the, a whole system solution and it requires, you know, working across team boundaries and working within your team. So we look for, you know, people who are, um, 
who who know how to how to collaborate effectively, um, who know how to you know look at uh, system level you know trade offs and and work through those and not, aren't always you know going to be stuck on their own idea but are going to be able to evaluate ideas you know data driven and and really understand you know what what the right path is uh, for us you know as a, as a company and get on board and help help pursue that path. And then if someone's you know, looking at the, uh, the path to a CTO, uh, we've kind of covered this a little bit, but just maybe to like kind of bring it all together, like, like what advice would you have for, for someone that's you know, starting out their career and they do have that you know, aspiration to eventually you know, run a, a, you know, a team, whether it's you know, CTO or uh, as an executive in a company? Yeah, I think you know, my, my advice is um, to always focus on impact. You know, whatever you're doing, whatever, you know, right now you're you're focused on, if, if you are looking beyond just the, the current, you know, small problem you're working on and thinking about how does it connect to a bigger picture? What's it enabling? What's the, you know, and really try to help with that higher level impact, you know, try to make sure that you're delivering the right answers, the right solution that's going to achieve the, the impact. Um, so if you stay focused on that, um, and then another part of it, you know, which we haven't touched on yet is, is um, storytelling, being able to communicate, you know, what, what you're building, why you're building it, what it's, it's going to help achieve. Um, that's an important part of getting to CTO as well, is that communication piece. Um, it sounds simple, but it actually isn't. You know, as we know, you have to really become an expert before you can explain something in a way that others can understand. Um, and it, it becomes really important, whether you're pitching an idea to an investor or whether you're describing, you know, or internally you're trying to propose a new direction for, for the company strategy or whether you're explaining to the board the progress that you're making on a program. You know, you really need to hone that skill of um, being able to communicate complex, you know, technical topics in a way that people can understand and not just, you know, understand for sort of first order or superficially, but really understand, you know, contextualize what that means in terms of what you're trying to achieve, what the challenges are that you're facing, how you're going to get through those challenges and how it all connects to an ultimate larger goal. What about like, uh, you know, keeping yourself marketable and being able to balance that with technology of the future. When I look at your career, you were early with autonomous systems. You were working with drones early, like drones are more, you know, uh, you know, they're everywhere now, but back when you were working with them, they were still an area that was growing. Um, you know, you're, you're building something that is, you know, you know, maybe years from now will be like, oh yeah, that was you know, every, no one drives anymore. Who knows, right? Who knows what the future will look like? But you're, you've always been kind of pushing the envelope as it relates to the technical problems that you and your team have been trying to solve. How much do you think that affects someone's ability to, you know, be a CTO of, you know, you know that forward looking and hopefully not being too early to market either? Yeah, certainly. You know, part of me uh, attributes it to luck. I had I had good luck, you know, and getting, you know, being in the right place at the right time. But the other part of me attributes it to this back to this idea of impact. I was always looking for, you know, what really listening, trying to understand what the problems were we were trying to solve. What, you know, whether it's a customer problem or a national security problem, or, you know, here a whole society problem around transportation of the future. Um, really trying to understand and think about what, you know, what are those solutions? So I talked a little bit about, um, you know, as I transitioned out of the industrial and, you know, more military applications into commercial. It was it was really kind of mission driven. It was around you know I saw this this opportunity. I saw where you know there was this new technology coming into this new space that that I knew something about it that could help make it successful that others might not know. And um, and so you know I pursued that to try to 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 help. Um, so if you're focused on impact and really trying to solve important problems it usually leads you in the right direction. You might not know exactly where that end is going to be, but if you're kind of following and aligning your passions with really important problems, then you use those things usually, um, you know, build up to, to a career, you know, where you, have, where you have that kind of impact and opportunity for positions like CTO. So we've talked about your career, you've accomplished a lot and you still have a lot more to, to tackle, of course. Um, you know, you decided to write a book too. So you're an author. 
which it was recently published, right? Like when, That's right, this year, or I guess, no, 2020. So talk about how that came together. What was the book about? Like what all the details there. Yeah, it was, again, not something I planned on, um, <laughs> but just sort of happened. I, I mentioned this conference, um, you know, that I gave this talk at, and it, it's an invite-only conference. Uh, it's the one that Jeff Bezos holds called Mars. Um, so a lot of industry this is, for, for the audience, because I thought this was cool when I was doing my research on Laura before we had our prep call on, on Monday on our, our Twitter feed, there's a, a picture with her with Mark Hamill. I'm like, wait, that's so cool. She gets to go to these conferences and meet Mark Hamill. That's amazing. <laughs> yes, it's a really well cultivated conference, uh, you know, opportunity of a lifetime to bring together, you know, science fiction and reality, real, real scientists and engineers together with uh, with creatives and uh, with CEOs to have very uh, great discussions. And it was in that setting really where this book uh, kind of got, got off the ground. So I gave this talk um, to that audience around things we, we were seeing in the industrial world, things we learned over decades of time and how they could apply to, to the commercial space. And, um, and afterwards, yeah, I was approached by a number of people who said, you know, this would make a great book topic. And um, I was not at all thinking that direction. I, at the time I had young, you know, my kids were very young. I had a baby, um, I had a, you know, blossoming career at Draper and was very busy. Uh, and, but um, I, had a, I had a collaborator, Julie Shaw, who uh, we were having lunch af actually after the conference. And, um, and we had, you know, we, our teams were working together on some research projects. And, uh, and I mentioned this to her, you know, we were sort of reflecting on the conference. And, and she, um, she said, you know, she agreed, this would be a great book topic. And I said, Julie, you know, I don't have time to write a book. <laughs> said, yeah, I don't either. <laughs> and, um, and we said, you know, we could join forces here. And uh, she was studying these problems in the research setting, you know, so she was a deep expert in uh, kind of where, you know, what we were learning about human, you know, how you design machine learning to really to work with people. And I was designing, you know, uh, systems that were, you know, using these techniques to, you know, to change the way we were approaching all kinds of industrial, you know, applications. And, um, and so we decided let's join forces and, and write this book together. And it took us a while. It was, it was a couple of years in the making, um, but it was, it was a really fun process for us. Uh, she would, she and I, we, we joke, uh, there's a restaurant called Catalyst in Cambridge, which we joke was our office. But luckily pre COVID, we would get together for lunch once a week and, um, talk through the topics and, um, and eventually, you know, led us to, to the book. What's the name of the book? What to expect when you're expecting robots. Which is a very clever title because I read what to expect when you're expecting, uh, which is about expecting your first baby. Uh, so yeah, so it's just, so if you had to summarize what the book is about, just in case, you know, someone wants to hopefully buy it and read it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, yeah, it's all about, um, you know, what we've been talking about really, um, across my career, which is, you know, as these uh, robots, you know, enter kind of our everyday world, um, what's needed to, you know, to really um, uh, make them successful and effective uh, in, in helping us with our, with our everyday lives. So it's, it's about robots entering the commercial space and, and all of the, you know, the sort of intersection of technology and society solutions that are needed to, to make these robots uh, truly effective. Yeah, very cool. All right, so we're gonna shift over to the Q and A now because uh, we've got a bunch of questions here. Yes. So, um, all right. So one question here is: um, CTOs typically have an easier time talking about the last five years of their career rather than the first five years. How did you make the jump from individual contributor to management? How did you take on more responsibility? How long did it take you to be ready for that? How much of those skills carry through to your role today? So I guess the, to summarize that, it's, you know, so how, how did you eventually get recognized as an individual contributor to manage people? And how did you kind of learn that role? Yeah, that's a good question. In interesting, um, yeah, approach to the question. So, um, you know, early on, I think, again, I, I always um, was trying to look beyond my piece, you know, the part of the system I was working on and try to, you know, kind of look, you know, so when I was at Draper early on, I saw that there was, there were many programs that I could help that this, this special, you know, area of expertise that I had could really help um, these other programs. And so I started trying to kind of grow that myself. I became an entrepreneur kind of within the company. And, um, and so I, 
you know, my early roles, um, you know, leadership roles were really created by me. They weren't given to me. It wasn't, they weren't things that were um, kind of natural next steps. Um, I created, I created new programs. I created a, a group. I went by my first group. I went, you know, to my, my bosses at the time. And I, I said, I really think we could do even more if we formed a team around this. And we really had, if I could have focus, you know, on creating the strategy and growing the team, growing the technology, um, as opposed to being an individual contributor. And, uh, and they sort of took a chance on me. I convinced them um, that there was an opportunity here. And they said, okay, you know, it's maybe not quite the right time. We're not quite there yet, Laura, but let's give you a shot. Um, and so uh, usually, you know, and after that same thing that my next role, I. I really, you know, kind of created it myself. Um, so, so that's happened a lot. Um, that happened a lot early in my career. It wasn't about just kind of waiting for that, you know, opportunity to come to you. It's about how do you, how do you create, you know, that, that path for yourself and maybe the, the best position, you know, that you could do next doesn't exist yet. Um, so, you know, I would say don't hesitate to reach out um, to others in your network or your supervisor, who, whoever, you know, mentors um, to, to help shape, uh, you know, a direction that you want to go or where you, again, where you see that you, there could be an impact to the business that you're in or to a new, to a new business. Um, I think it's taking that initiative and really taking ownership of your career to guide it, to steer it. If one pat, if one door isn't opening, look for another door, you know, try to kind of proactively and, and don't give up too. I won't say it always came easy early on. I wanted to create that team long before I brought that idea forward. Um, and I, you know, wasn't able to, so, um, I, you know, don't, don't give up. And I, I had programs, you know, that, that didn't go as far as I wanted them to. And sometimes, you know, things, failures or the miss, you know, opportunities that don't progress in the way you want, those are learning moments too. And it, those aren't wasted time. Those are, you know, I think some, probably most CTOs would, will tell you they learned um, the most in the moments where they failed um, or where they were part of something that failed. And so take risks and uh, take initiative and, and kind of, I'd say, you know, don't, don't be passive about it, but take an active role in, in that, those early years. Now there's a there's a few questions here that um, you know people are just curious like how do you you know balance right if you're uh, an executive at a company that's a startup or super high growth it's a very demanding position mm -hmm. uh, you know having a family whether it's you're male or female it's 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 a del delicate balancing act so so how do you balance your time and the ability to you know do your job well yet you know uh, you know you know parenting is is, is challenging too. Absolutely. Um, it is. And I, I, I seek, you know, I like that term, you know, work-life harmony. Um, you know, I, I do try to find ways to, to be the best in, in both. Um, you know, I know that that's hard and, and not always possible, but, you know, I involve my kids in my work. Um, you know, I can, they love learning about our robot cars. Um, I show them videos first before they go live. You know, they love reading about, you know, what we're doing, what our latest press releases, they get excited. Um, also, you know, when I was writing my book, I had my, my daughter at the time who was about six, you know, she decided she wanted to contribute to the book. <laughs> Some time where she and I, you know, worked on her, her book. Um, and so trying to find ways to, um, to harmonize the two. And I think, you know, I've always seen it as an opportunity having two daughters uh, to normalize this idea that, you know, women also, you know, ha are equally uh, can, you know, become engineers, can, can lead teams, can be bosses. Um, and so that sort of you know, I view that as a value added to them that, you know, when I'm successful in my career, I'm also teaching, teaching them. But just like Keith, you mentioned as a, you know, as a young child going into your parents' office, I try to create that. I can't, it's not quite the same, of course, at, at this level. Um, I can't have them in the office all the time, but I do, I do try to find ways to expose, um, expose them um, to, to my work and what I'm doing. But also, you know, I think it's important to, to take time to unplug. Um, on the on the other side, um, you know, I, I will say my best ideas often come to me in the middle of the night, or when I'm out on a walk, or when I'm driving in the car. It's rarely when I'm sitting behind my computer, you know. It's um, often when I can. So I think you know, for many reasons, I, I you know, it's important to me to unplug, to take time to unplug every week, um, and one, be present with my kids, get on the floor, and you know, play a game. I played just this morning. I played Connect Four with my four-year-old over. <laughs> 
Um, so I try to find ways to, you know, always um, be engaged in, in their world, in their lives, um, be present with them. And I find that that benefits me at work. You know, it's kind of uh, surprising, but often those are the moments when you're not thinking about work at all, when, when things click and when you realize something that maybe you hadn't quite put together when you were in the weeds of, of work. Um, so yeah, unplugging, uh, being present, taking every moment when I do have time with them, trying to immerse myself in their world, um, but then also exposing them to my world. So I'm a father of two teenage girls and, um, you know, we need more females in leadership roles in tech and other industries. So, so what advice would you have as far as, um, you know, helping solve that problem of getting more female leadership? Yeah, I am a big believer in um, exposing young girls, you know, um, to, uh, to this model that, you know, women are leaders too, and that women are scientists and women are engineers. I think normalizing that idea uh, is really important and finding ways STEM ways to do that. I've been involved in a program here called Science Club for Girls, uh, where it's an after school program to, you know, uh, let, you know, kids love, girls and boys love science experiments. I mean, we're shooting off rockets and building volcanoes in my house on a, you know, almost daily basis. <laughs> um, so exposing more kids to that, um, you know, I think helps. I think that's one part of it. It's not the only thing. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot we do to try to recruit and make sure that we have diverse candidates coming in, uh, make sure that we have, you know, hiring practices. It's really important um, that, are, that are not, you know, biased. Um, training our, our leadership, you know, to overcome uh, unconscious bias. Um, these are things, you know, that, that don't happen overnight. I mean, it's, you know, we've made a, a tremendous amount of progress and I'm actually, you know, emotional. I'm, I'm so proud to be a part of the culture here that it really is um, supportive and, uh, you know, we, we really uh, value diversity and you can kind of see it in all that we do, but it's not like that everywhere. Um, I would say it's probably not like that most places. Um, and so there's still a lot of work that we need to do. And I think making sure executives are trained on the, the value of diversity and overcoming unconscious bias um, is, is a really important step we need to take too. Yeah, and that, it's that exposure element that I agree. Um, you know, just, you know, two teenage girls, I want to expose them to the world of possibilities. And you don't know what you don't know. So if you're not exposed, how do you know that that's an opportunity that you could explore? So um, my girls will be watching this video like there because like to, to, to listen to, um, you know, what you set out to do and how you've accomplished each step along the way uh, to create a like technology that could change the world. You know, that's just like an amazing inspirational story that more people need to hear because it's, you know, like STEM education is becoming like where I live. Actually, there's a STEM high school that is doing an amazing job. Um, but I think just kids need to know more about STEM early on because I don't think, you know, they get exposure in school, but not to the degree of what can I do professionally with that? Like, what can I do to change the world with that? Right. Change the environment, climate, you know, like there's all these things that we need the best minds to be working on. So, uh, exposure is so key. Yeah. And I think, you know, highlighting that it's fun and that it can connect to whatever their interests are. I remember when I was doing, you know, when I was a mentor at the Science Club for Girls program with my fourth grade girls, um, you know, I would tell them, hey, you know, as they're putting on makeup in the back of the room, I tell them, you know, those cosmetic companies have teams of chemical engineers, you know, trying to figure out just the right, you know, texture and color. And, and they're like, really, you know, so, so surprised. So, you know, um, you know, I think connecting it to, to things that are fun and things that are exciting to, uh, to girls as well is, um, you know, it helps a lot. So a couple of the questions are talk about, like, it's a stressful job that you're in. So how do you remain positive, you know, during stressful times, you know, maybe something doesn't go well that you're trying to accomplish with the tech or, you know, it just dynamics of building an organization. So how do you, you know, keep that? And then like, how do you, how are you able to do things that you don't even know what to do yet? Like the, the imposter syndrome that people talk about, it's like, if you don't, if you haven't done it yet, how do you know how to do it? So how do you remain positive and how do you overcome those challenges of, figuring stuff out? 
Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I think I've, I've sort of lived my career at the edge of trying to do things that haven't been done yet, you know, the edge of what's possible. Um, and, you know, I think the only way to uh, survive and to stay sane in careers like that is to um, stay optimistic. I mean, it might sound simple. Um, and I think, again, going back to having a, a family of entrepreneurs, you know, always being optimistic about what you know, what's possible. And even if you can't see it yet, even if it's not quite there, even if you don't know the path, continuing to pursue it. Um, and, you know, perseverance, I think is a big part of it. Um, and, and also, I think, being data driven and knowing um, when to pivot, knowing that, you know, again, I, I said earlier that some, you know, some of my failures are the times when I learned the most. Um, and, you know, I think, so not being afraid to fail, or fail in whatever you know sense that is, um, but but being you know when there are those moments, being ready to very quickly pivot, to say what did I just learn and how can we still be successful in this in the bigger picture? What what can we do next to overcome this this failure or this problem? Um, but certainly it's you know there are moments of, of stress, um, and I think you know having a strong team that you work with, having uh, confidants, mentors who you can talk to in those moments also to to um, clear your own head, to externalize what you're going through, get some advice. I think those are important uh, things as well. Uh, as you're scaling an organization that's, you know, whether it's, you know, hundred people, hundreds of people or thousands of people, right? Um, how should people think about leadership and scaling the culture of an engineering organization? So how do you think about culture as your team scales? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I realized this, someone uh, told, pointed this out to me early on when I had went from leading a small team of, you know, 15 people to a hundred person team that, you know, you really do have to fundamentally change your style. And so often, you know, you, you got to that point by doing, doing something well, you were leading a small team well, you created a great small culture, but then you have to really think about how does that scale? How do you, you're going to have to change how you do things, but you want to preserve the things that worked well. Um, so when I had a small team, you know, we had journal club, we had, you know, we, we shared problems and we would work through them together. I, I created this very, you know, collaborative culture of learning, constant learning and helping each other uh, solve problems. And so I wanted to do that at scale. So when you do that at scale, you can't do that anymore, but you can set up, you know, you can, one, you can teach the people who work for you how to do that. So teach them how to do the things that, that worked well for you. And then also you can set up programs or approaches um, that, that implement those things that you did locally, but can do that more broadly. Um, so I'm always still looking for, you know, ways to uh, take the things that work well in small groups and apply, you know, figure out how to apply them at scale. Um, but some of it's about trial and error too. You try one initiative and if, if it doesn't work again, learn from it and try another one. Um, but, it, but, you know, constantly um, trying to work on the culture, making that a proactive, um, you know, activity is, is an important part of being, a, I think, a successful CTO. You, it's not enough to just, you know, drive the team. You have to also be thinking about, you know, like right now we're doing a career development series internally because we had a lot of interest, you know, on, of people on, you know, how do they grow their career? Um, so, you know, always thinking and looking for ways that you can uh, continue to improve the culture and add new dimensions to, you know, keep growing the team, improving and improving the culture. Great, great advice. Well, Laura, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through your professional journey, all the insights into the role of a, of a CTO, and all the great advice for others to follow. Because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing what Motional is doing. Um, and, you know, just as another sideline, like you guys are hiring. So if you want to check out their job listings, go to VentureFizz, go to VentureFizz.com backslash Motional. So there's three things I'm going to include. So I'm going to include in the chat my LinkedIn profile. I'm going to include just VentureFizz. Someone asked, like, how do I find jobs on VentureFizz? So there's the URL for that. And then I'm going to put the URL for um, Motional's jobs all there. So if you want to connect on LinkedIn, shoot me uh, an invite. Happy to accept all uh, invites. Uh, check out Motional's jobs. They are hiring. And I am like, I get fired up when I get to talk to someone like you because you're very inspirational. And what Motional is building is just, it's going to change our world. So like I get all fired up for that. So thanks for taking the time and for sharing all the great, great advice.
Thank you. Yeah, and it's a great place to work. Like you said, we are mission driven. We have an exciting mission. We have an energized team and we would love, you know, uh, for any of you that are interested to please reach out, please apply. Uh, we'd love to uh, join, have you join our team. Well, everyone, thanks for joining us during this lunch hour of uh, our Path to Event series. I think there's another new feature that I'm trying, or new to me, uh, on Zoom that gives you a survey afterwards. So love your feedback. If it's like, hey, you know, next time I'd like to see this, any feedback, I'm open, you know, all ears to uh, make these events even better. But Laura, again, this was a very inspirational conversation. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care.